Hello Year 4 and this is your reading lesson for Friday the 5th of February and once again we are going to listen to your next few chapters and add to our reading journal. Now what I've seen on Class Dojo is brilliant, you've come up with some really good questions about what's going to happen next. Um, so quick recap, then on the bus, uh, Finton and Gribbly were on the bus and Finton spotted Gonzales, the spy sent by um, Buckmeister and Randall and <laughs> Finton decided to go and speak to him and to apologise for setting fire to his beard and whilst this was all going on um, Eric and Edith Bumstead were following in their pinched um, vehicle they, they um, was the burrito van wasn't it or the uh, tortilla van and they were getting hungry so they were deci decided to cook raw sausages um, whilst they were following and then they spotted Finton at the back of the bus with what they thought was a bomb but it was actually a walkie talkie somehow that got thrown out at um, Eric and Edith Bumstead and that made them crash their van um, so after all that Finton they arrived at Quarantina's is it great granddaughters and they stopped there um, and then they were going in search of the choco plum the next day and whilst all this was going on Randall and Buckmeister were of gigantic giganti foods were in the process of following them and stealing all the choco plums they didn't care about the local people they just want the choco plums all for themselves so we are going to start with chapter 18 19 and 20 what could possibly go wrong now who's going to get to the choco plums first i wonder gonzalez Chapter 18. Gonzales was hiding in the undergrowth, peering through his binoculars and trying hard to suppress a fit of giggles. For several minutes, he'd been watching the hilarious spectacle of Finton attempting to learn how to paddle a wooden canoe. The older man sitting at the front had mastered the paddling technique fairly quickly, but was being seriously let down by the gangly idiot sitting at the back. Despite Anna's shouted instructions from the bank, they could do nothing more than wobble from one side of the river to the other, where they'd wedge in the mud and occasionally go round in circles. When it eventually became clear which direction they were supposed to be heading in, Gonzales crept furtively downstream through the trees to survey the land ahead. It seemed he would have no problem trailing them on foot, which was lucky as there was no sign of a second boat anywhere. He could see through his binoculars, however, that a short distance ahead, the river split into two. That wasn't good. If they took the right fork, he would be stuck on the wrong side of the river and lose them. He ran a little way upstream and considered his options. There didn't appear to be many. Several massive jungle trees overhung the water, and one in particular looked like a pretty good way to get across to the other side. He swatted the annoying flies away from his smelly hair, climbed carefully up the tree and began crawling out along a large leafy branch. A short distance back down river, Anna had finally managed to explain to Finton where he was going wrong. With their canoe pointing roughly in the right direction, the strong current took hold of them and they were away. Hurriedly, they shouted their thanks and waved farewells, farewells to their guide. Finton was pretty certain he wouldn't miss her, but Gribbly wasn't so sure. He was about to head deep into the Amazon rainforest with an accident-prone 14-year-old boy who couldn't even paddle in a straight line. This was an extremely worrying prospect and one he couldn't believe he had allowed himself to be talked into. Gonzales crawled into position on his branch, took cover behind a mass of leaves and lifted his binoculars to his eyes. He could hear them coming, coming before he could actually see them. Finton was sloshing his wood, long wooden paddle around with all the grace of an ice skating giraffe. Gribbly was trying to get him to paddle in rhythm but it seemed the boy had no sense of timing at all. Most of his attempts resulted in him swiping the surrounding bushes or sticking his oar in the mud. Even when he did manage to get to the right end of it in the water, it only resulted in a lot of splashing and very little forward momentum. The river forks here, sir, said Gribbly, ignoring the waves of dirty brown water Finton was sloshing on the back of his head. According to Anna's map, we need to go to the right, so you'll need to paddle on your right side so we steer that way. 
OK, said Finton, plunging his oar to the left side. Gonzalez tutted to himself from behind his clump of leaves. Perhaps the boy really was an idiot. The fact that they were heading to the right did mean, however, that he had been right to plan ahead, as he would now have to climb to the opposite, vi opposite side of the bank to avoid losing them. No, sir, paddle on the other side, shouted Gribbly, wondering why they were heading towards the wrong fork. The other side! Oh, sorry, Gribbs, said Finton, quickly hoisting his oar overhead in a huge swinging arc. The mathematical odds against hitting a man in the face with an eight-foot paddle while he is hiding in a tree in the jungle are astronomically huge. However, that was exactly what happened. Gonzales was vaguely aware of a hard, flat object suddenly appearing before his eyes and hearing a loud cracking sound before fading into unconsciousness. He slumped senseless on to his branch, then slowly slid out of the tree and into the river. Finton and Gribbley didn't hear the loud splash made by, by Gonzales hitting the water behind them, as it was masked by the other loud splashes coming from the back end of the boat. After a lot of effort and precarious wobbling about, they managed to persuade their shallow wooden canoe to go the right way. Gonzales wasn't unconscious for very long. In fact, as soon as the first sudden rush of muddy water forced itself up his nose, he rapidly recovered some of his senses. His eyes flew open and stared in shock. It appeared the world had got a lot thicker. It had also turned a murky shade of greeny brown and had lumps floating in it. This and the fact that he is, was finding it difficult to breathe suggested he was drowning. Gasping and retching, he clawed his way up the surface and flailed uselessly around before grabbing at a floating branch. Breathing heavily, he clung to his moss-covered life raft, life raft and grew increasingly furious. He could scarcely believe it, but Finton had outwitted him yet again. The idiot kid had somehow got the better of him for a third time. On the plus side, however, he wasn't dead and he could still hear Finton's hopeless attempts at paddling, which meant his enemy couldn't be far ahead. He also didn't have to worry about smelling of dogwee anymore. For a moment, he contemplated getting back onto the bank, but as the strong river, river current was carry, carrying him along behind them, he decided he might as well stay in the water and let the current do the work. After a while, a slightly sturdier raft of jungle foliage floated alongside him, which would offer better camouflage. Cunningly concealed by leaves and clutching the slippery moss-covered log, Gonzales drifted discreetly behind, keeping a watchful eye on Finton up ahead. This wasn't so bad, he told himself. Certainly a lot easier than walking. This, was, this positive thought managed to keep him cheerful for a while. Well, it did until he entered the bit of river with the piranhas in it. <laughs> oh dear. Right, chapter 19. After spending several unhappy hours sitting on the roadside arguing about what to do next and whose fault it was that they had to do it, the Bumsteads had managed to flag down a passing lorry. Encountering any traffic at all along the isolated forest road was extremely rare, so they were grateful to have a lift. They sat in the cab of the huge logging truck laden with enormous trees and grinned at the driver. He appeared to speak no English at all, which suited them perfectly, as there were no good as they were no good at polite conversation and hadn't yet thought up a reasonable explanation as to how they'd got there. The driver was just as happy to ignore his passengers, though he did wind down his window fairly quickly to get some fresh air. Tinny music played non stop on the man's radio, which was turned up far too loud. After an hour or so of eventful lurching and bumping along amid, amid endless dense forest, the music stopped for the news bulletin. Eric and Edith, of course, had no idea what the Brazilian newsreader was saying, but did notice that the truck driver suddenly started looking at them in a funny way. As indeed he would. According to the radio news, a fat young man and skinny old woman of European appearance had viciously attacked an innocent hot dog vendor in Santo Colejo and stolen his vehicle. Police were warning the public not to approach them, as they were considered highly dangerous. Armed units were at that moment searching for the fugitives and their stolen vehicle and had set up roadblocks to catch them. Aware that the trucker was eyeing him suspiciously, Eric grinned stupidly and made a matey thumbs up gesture. It didn't appear to make the driver any more friendly. The tinny music returned and the truck rumbled on. For another hour or so, no one spoke. Eric and Edith gazed vacantly out the window at the seemingly endless forest, while the truck driver gave them the odd dirty look. 
Eventually the lorry began to slow as they entered a small, dilapidated looking town. It wasn't much of a town, just a meagre cluster of houses, a petrol station and something that appeared to be a general store. Ahead there was a short line of stationary traffic. Typical, tutted Edith, miles from nowhere and we get stuck in a traffic jam. Eric craned his head to see what was causing the hold-up. About a hundred yards ahead was a line of police cars with their blue lights flashing and several policemen searching the passing vehicles. This wasn't good. The police made Eric nervous, mostly because they tended to arrest him quite a lot. It then occurred to him that he had recently stolen a hot dog van in broad daylight in front of dozens of witnesses. This definitely wasn't good. We'd better get out of here, he said urgently to his mother, who was contentedly humming along with the tune on the radio. What? she said. Why? This isn't a proper town. This is the middle of nowhere. What are we going to do here? Eric gestured as subtly as, pos as subtly as possible towards the blue flashing lights. There's a police roadblock. Look, I reckon they're after us. Edith still had a bit of catching up to do. Don't be daft. Why would they be after us? We didn't do nothing. It was the fedora kid that blew up the... A five-watt bulb of understanding lit a dark corner of her gloomy mind. Oh, right, we nicked the van, she said. The driver changed down another gear and, keeping a suspicious eye on his passengers, brought, brought the truck to a halt with a loud hissing of brakes. Eric immediately grabbed the door handle and grinned at the driver again. We'll get out of here, mate, he said quickly. Cheers for the lift and all that. The pair of scruffy fugitives scrambled down the lorry's cab and began walking briskly towards its rear end, where they could take cover. Now what do we do? muttered Edith, preparing herself for another round of criticising her useless son. Oh, I don't know, do I? blurted Eric. Give me a chance. On the left of the road was the sa same impenetrable mass of rainforest they'd been passing through for hours. On the right was the little general stall. Come on, we can go in there, said Eric, and quickly scuttled over to it. Edith followed behind, deliberately looking anywhere but towards the waiting police cars. The stall was as might be expected, virtually empty. In a remote communi community like this, there weren't many regular customers, so it catered to passing trade like loggers and truck drivers. Unfortunately, it also seemed to cater for the occasional, occasional heavily armed police patrol. In fact, apart from Eric and Edith, the only person browsing in the shop was a huge, mean-looking policeman with a dark moustache, dark glasses, a gun hanging from his belt. Natural, stay calm, whispered Eric to his terrified looking mother, then picked up a basket and pretended to be looking at the shelves. Edith followed his example and grabbed a basket of her own. The only problem with this ploy was that they were both painfully hungry again and the shelves were packed with a tempting array of foods. Edith's stomach churned noisily, still attempting to digest a mixture of semi poisonous berries and semi cooked sausages. Not wishing to attract unwanted attention, she bit her lip and forced herself to keep her smelly convulsions inside for once. Eric strolled down an aisle full of family-sized bags of crisps and nuts and tried to think rationally. It looked like that they'd have to make a run for it any minute, so he might as well pick up a few essentials while he could. Seeing as they were already wanted for vehicle theft and assault, a little bit of shoplifting couldn't make things much worse. Having decided on this, his idiotic plan of action... He immediately began stuffing as much junk as he could into the, his basket. Crisps, biscuits, beer, sweets, cake, and some funny-looking things covered in pastry. Edith, noticing her son's sudden shoplifting spree, realised that he was up what he was up to and started to grab large handful, handfuls of items herself. They were just shoveling an entire display of chocolate biscuits into their best baskets when the shop door opened behind them. It was the logging truck driver again, only this time he wasn't alone. He appeared to have found an even bigger armed policeman than the one who was already there. Eric and the huge Brazilian policeman made eye contact and for a moment stood dead still. Realising it was now or never, the bumsteads let out a shriek, barged past them and ran straight out of the open door. There was a sudden barrage barrage of angry Portuguese shouting behind them which they assumed meant something like yes that's them officer and stop or I shoot without waiting to find out they belted as fast as they could across the road further warnings were shouted and ignored closely followed by cracks of gunfire 
Still clutching their heavily laden shopping baskets, Eric and Edith hollered in mortal terror and plunged into the thick tropical undergrowth. Now what do we do? screeched Edith, not used to being shot at. Just keep running, advised her son, who wasn't used to being shot at either, but was pretty familiar with running away. The angry shouts grew louder. It appeared several other policemen had joined their colleagues and were giving chase, firing as they went. More bullets zipped past their heads and thudded into the trees. Not being particularly athletic, it was purely undiluted fear that enabled the bumsteads to run full tilt into the jungle. For more than 20 minutes, they weaved through the dense maze of greenery and didn't even stop when a couple of packets of chocolate biscuits fell out of Edith's basket. basket. Eric, Edith wheezed eventually. Eric, stop, I can't run anymore. Red-faced and sweating profusely, they stopped and slumped to the ground. Apart from the noise of a few insects and their own unhealthy gasping breath, the forest was completely quiet. Several pin minutes passed with no sound of gunfire or shouts from pursuing policemen. It looked like they had lost them. Unfortunately, it also seemed they had lost themselves. One bit of rainforest looked very much like any other bit. They had no map, no compass, no survival gear, no tents, hammocks or sleeping bags. Worse still, they had no idea where they were or what they were going to do next. They did, however, have some edible food for a change. As soon as they got their breathing under control, they helped themselves to several bags of crisps each, opened some cans of beer and cheered themselves up with a long overdue picnic. Wow, well, the bumsteads. Everyone seems to be getting themselves into quite a pickle. Right, chapter 20. By the time they'd covered their first five miles of river, Finton's paddling had improved considerably. He was hitting the back of Gribbler's head with his oar a lot less often. Progress had been erratic and at times frightening, but somehow with the help of the current, they had stayed on course and not got lost at all. Daylight was fading fast and Finton was fading even faster. Ironically, just as he actually seemed to have got the hang of paddling, they reached the landmark Anna had told them about. On their left-hand side was a steep bank of pinkish rock split by by a spectacular waterfall where a sep separate river tributary flowed into theirs. Anna had made it very clear that they should abandon the boat before the two rivers merged and to keep well clear of the resulting dangerous waters. Luckily, Gribbley had remembered this important piece of information and steered them to the right side where they managed to drag the boat up the shallow muddy bank. Unused to such hard physical work, they hauled their heavy packs from their boat and set up their first proper jungle camp with aching arms. Rather than a tent, they had brought hammocks which could be suspended between trees and covered with mosquito nets. Once these were ready, they sat exhausted on an old messy log and planned their evening meal. This meant gathering dry wood for a fire and finding a temporary home for the peanut butter sandwich collection so they could use the cooking pot. Gribbley, being well skilled in the culinary arts, was able to produce a surprisingly good stew from the dried ingredients he'd brought along. And the cup of hot tea he made next was the best thing they'd tasted in days. After a quick clean up, Finton restocked and sealed the pot, then produced a length of rope from his rucksack. Gribbley watched, intrigued, as he threw the rope over a tree branch, tied one end to the handle of the iron cooking pot, and began hauling it several feet into the air. "'May I ask what you're doing, Master Finton?' inquired Gribbley. Finton grinned, proud of his advanced jungle survival knowledge. "'Ah, it's something I read about in The Young Adventurer,' he said. "'All the famous jungle explorers do this. "'You're supposed to hang your food up a tree "'so that animals can't get to it.' "'I'm fairly sure they couldn't get to it anyway, sir,' observed Gribbley. "'It is secured inside a strong iron pot with a fixed lid, after all.' Can't be sure enough. Some of these animals are pretty clever, said Finton sagely while attempting to tie the end of the rope to a tree trunk. Please be, please be sure to tie a strong knot, sir. We wouldn't want it to fall, would we? Finton tutted at Gribbley's obvious lack of faith in his practical ability. Duh! Of course I will, he said dismissively. I used to be in the Cub Scouts, remember? Indeed, sir, said Gribbley. Though if I remember correctly, it was ra a rather brief membership. They were a little upset about that scout hut burning down. Relax, Gribbs. If there's one thing I'm good at, it's tying secure knots, said Finton, with an air of finality. Unfortunately, his left boot lace was undone and trailing in the mud as he said it. By now it was completely dark and they were thoroughly worn out. There seemed little left to do but climb into their hammocks and go to sleep. 
A few hours later, dawn broke over the jungle. About half a mile west of Finton's camp, Wrench's black executive helicopter was hovering noisily above the canopy, thrashing the treetops with the down blast from its rotors. According to his data, they were directly over the map coordinates of his planned dropping point. The rainforest was, of course, far too dense to allow a landing, so he was carefully winched down to the forest floor, followed by his rucksack full of fantastically expensive technical equipment. Once safely on the ground, he signalled for the pilot to depart and immediately checked his tracking gear. A little red light was blinking on and off and making a satisfying beep noise. The tiny device Gonzales had planted in, fin planted in Finton's rucksack appeared to be working perfectly and indicating that young Master Fedora was, as expected, very close by. So close by, in fact, that his nice lion had been ruined. Did you hear that, Gribbs? he said from the depths of his sleeping bag. Sounded like a helicopter. Indeed, I did, sir, replied, replied Gribbley, who was already up and preparing breakfast. Rather unusual to hear one this deep into the rainforest, I imagine. After a good bowl of porridge and a nice mug of tea, Gribbley and Finton dismantled their camp and packed their damp, sweaty gear into their rucksacks. It was only an hour or so after dawn and already stiflingly, stiflingly hot, so they made sure they had plenty of drinking water handy. Gribbley had, of course, had the sense to bring a compass. So after consulting Anna's map, he was able to work out roughly which direction to walk in. When's it going to be my turn to have the map? asked Finton eagerly. I want to be group leader today, please. Reluctantly, Gribbley handed over the vital scrap of paper, but kept the compass and made a mental note to be involved in any navigation decisions. With their heavy loads hoisted onto their backs, they set off into the thick tangle of jungle. A few hundred yards away, Wrench noticed the little red light begin to move on his tracking screen. Things were going perfectly to plan. The idiot boy was going to lead him straight to the legendary Choco Plum Grove. Quickly, he grabbed his super lightweight high-tech equipment and followed from a safe distance. Walking through rainforest terrain isn't easy. The ground underfoot is uneven, strewn with fallen branches and roots that can rip the unwary, that can trip the unwary. It can quickly change from slippery leaf cover to squelchy ankle deep mud. It involves struggling up steep treacherous slopes and slithering down rocky gullies. As if this isn't bad enough, the trees can be covered in nasty sharp spikes and an, and an assortment of vicious poisonous leaves. There are things crawling around in the trees too, which are only too happy to bite, nibble and sting any warm-blooded creature that walks by. There are snakes and mosquitoes and scorpions and leeches and even the possibility of the odd hungry jaguar. On top of all this though is the heat, a dull, heavy, energy sapping, humid heat that sits on you and weighs you down like a soggy duvet. Don't forget to keep drinking your water sir, you mustn't get dehydrated, said Gribbley at regular intervals during the day, prompted by Finton's prolonged bouts of silence and occasional stumble. I'm fine, thanks, insisted Finton, despite feeling thoroughly exhausted. Can we just stop here a minute, though, and have a look at the map? It was the third time they'd stopped and checked the map in the last two hours, and each time there had been a disagreement, followed by a change of direction. This time didn't look any different. Actually, Gribbs, I reckon you were right last time. We should have gone left, not straight on, said Finton, still a little confused as to how the compass worked. Sorry about that. You probably shouldn't listen to my suggestions. I'm usually wrong. Ever patient and tolerant Gribbley resisted the urge to say, I told you so, but agreed that they should turn around, retrace their path and then follow the new course. Stare Staring at his beeping device, Wrench noticed this new change of direction with alarm. The chaotic zigzagging route they'd been taking could mean only one thing. They must have worked out they were being followed and were trying to shake him off. Cursing this bit of bad luck, he turned to follow them and shrieked in terror as he came face to face with a wild-looking apparition. There was a tall, dark man with incredibly messy, matted hair staring directly at him. His face was scratched and blotchy and covered in what looked like teeth marks. Weirder still, he was wearing a pair of half-melted sunglasses and had the tufty remains of a false ginger beard glued to his face in little patches. Wrench fumbled for his gun and pointed it shakingly at the terrifying wild man. Stay back, he stammered, his voice squeaky with fear. I'm armed, see? Much to his surprise, the man began pointing 
at the Giganti Foods International logo emblazoned across Wrench's jacket. Don't shoot, he said with a strong Brazilian accent. I'm on your side. He reached into his ragged trouser pocket, produced a Giganti Foods International identi identity card and held it up for inspection. Gonzales, said Wrench, when he'd recovered from the sudden shock. The wreck of the man nodded. But I thought you were dead. For the next few mo minutes, Gonzales explained his long unfortunate story right up to the point where he'd been swept into the dangerous waters beneath the waterfall and pummeled around like a load of washing on spin cycle. It had been a painful battering, but at least, but had at least shaken off the last of the piranhas. He was also able to report the good news that Finton didn't appear to be armed. However, it was the news that the boy was in possession of a map that Wrench found most exciting. What? he exclaimed. A map to the fruit trees and no gun? Why didn't you say so before? Gonzales shrugged. How could I? he said. He threw my walkie-talkie out of the bus. This was fantastic news for Wrench. It meant he didn't have to trudge around following in the idiot kid's meandering footsteps anymore, and all he had to do was walk straight up to him and take the map. An image of taking candy from a baby popped into his head. The rules of the game had just changed in his favour. Ooh, it's getting very tense out in the Amazon rainforest. Right, so until next time when we find out what happens, see you later.